think it's true that in times of crisis, for any business, mission is going to be the compass to help you navigate through whatever trials or crisis comes your way. I learned that as I was reading this book called The Culture Code, and it recounted a story some of you might remember. It's a story about Johnson and & Johnson, and that's a, a healthcare company. They do a lot of medicine. Johnson & Johnson was a company started in 1943. And in 1943, the founder of the company set the mission out. And this is the beginning statement of his, of his mission, of his creed for the company, how they were going to operate. It says this, We believe our first responsibility is to doctors, nurses, patients, to mothers and fathers, and to all who use our products, and services. That's what the founder of the company said. This is what we're going to do as a company. Our first responsibility is to these people who use what we give them to make other people better. Now, interestingly enough, probably about 30 years later, a new leadership team came in and they began to look at that statement and they were trying to see, is this really affecting our company the way it should? But in, uh, I think it was the fall of 1982, something happened. Maybe some of you remember it. There was a, an outbreak in Chicago of deaths because some of the Tylenol that Johnson & Johnson had put out had been laced with Sinai. So some people using their products began to ingest this aspirin that had Sinai on it and they, they died. And so there was this great panic going on and everyone was freaked out. Okay, I have a Johnson & Johnson product. Is this, is this gonna happen to me? Health officials had to go out and warn people, hey, don't flush your stuff down the toilet because if it has cyanide, it's gonna get into the water system. Boy Scouts knocked on doors and said, hey, we gotta make sure that you're not taking any of this medicine. We don't know what's going on yet. Great time of crisis for the company, Johnson & Johnson. They were called into the principal's office, essentially, to meet with the FDA and the FBI to figure out how they were gonna handle this crisis. Now, the good news out of all of this was that all of the deaths and all of the, the different poisonings that had happened, it only took place in Chicago. So it was located there. They didn't hear any other deaths in the United States. So the FBI and the FDA said this, why don't you just keep the recall to Chicago area? We haven't heard any other incidents outside of this. We wanna make sure that this doesn't cause national panic. It doesn't encourage copycats. And most probably importantly of all for you as a company, if you do a national recall, it will cause panic and cost you up to $100 million to do that. The company came back, started to talk about it, came back to the FDA and the FBI and said, we're not gonna do that, we're doing a national recall. And they said, why would you choose to do that? And the leader of the company at that time said this, we believe our first responsibility is to doctors, nurses, patients, to mothers, fathers, and to all who use our product and services. See, the mission of the company drove what they were gonna do no matter what the crisis or circumstances was out there. And I think you can see a, a lesson or a correlation between what the church should be doing and the mission that we have and the different crises that we face. Currently, in this kind of crazy pandemic time, we have the, the temptation to be driven off into a number of different conversations and, and a number of different opportunities and a number of different things that we could get worked up about. But if we believe the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to go make disciples of all nations, no matter what crisis face us, that's what guides every single one of our decisions because it's the mandate that the Lord gave us. That is why we as a church, these, these three weeks, last week, this week, and next week, are gonna focus on this great commission. Why don't you turn to Matthew 28 with me and let's see how this is gonna affect our church so that we live and accomplish the mission that Christ gave for us. During times of crisis, mission will drive everything that we do. And the mission that God has given us is to go make disciples. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20 says this. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. If you were with us last week, we said we wanted to encapsulate those words right there into just a simple phrase. We as a church, to fulfill the Great Commission, are disciples advancing the gospel. And disciples who advance the gospel do what we did last week. They have a focus upward. They think about the, the possibility of the mission and the power of the mission being accomplished because we know the one we serve has authority over all things. And we know we don't need to fear or cower under the diff difficult and hard circumstances because Christ is with us 
always. The amazing thought to think the Holy Spirit entrusted to us, allowing Christ to be formed in us, is an amazing thought. That's what we focused on last week. But this week, we want to be people who make sure that we are disciples advancing the gospel, and how we do that specifically is when we focus inward. What does it mean to focus inward? I want you to think about it this way. We will be disciples who advance the gospel when we are disciples who become like Jesus. That is the call of the church inwardly. When you and I meet together in any circumstance, whether it's this Sunday morning in the great gathering of the body of Christ, or you get together in a Dwell Richly meeting, or you're coming to a prayer time, or you're going to a small group, every single one of those events should be designed for you to encourage a brother or sister in Christ, or you to be encouraged, that you are gonna grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And if you notice in this passage, it goes from the upward aspect to Jesus saying this, when you make a disciple, you baptize them, and you teach them to do everything that I commanded you. Now, before we hop into this text right here, I want you guys, just for the sake of time, to write down these three passages, just so you're, you're tracking along with me. Write down these three passages. Luke chapter six, verse 40 and 46. Luke chapter six, verse 40 and 46. And then Galatians 4, 19. So Luke chapter six, verses 40 and 46 and then Galatians 4.19, just so you and I are on the same page when we talk about discipleship. Because we've made the case in this series and in other series on discipleship that a disciple is a student striving to become like the savior who saved him. How do we know that that's true, that that's not just a statement we're making? Let's take a look at these scriptures. So listen to Luke 6.40, as Jesus just gives a parable, a statement that is generally true about what discipleship is. Luke 6.40 says, a disciple is not above his teacher, But every disciple, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. That's what discipleship is. That's the goal of of an apprentice relationship. That's the goal of a teacher-pupil relationship, that you're not gonna put yourself above the teacher to think that you're better than them, but your goal and aim in learning from them is that you will grow into likeness of them. So Luke 6, 40 is just a a parable, and Jesus used it a number of different times in the Gospels to say, if you're my disciple, you are gonna be one who becomes like me. But now if you drop down in Luke uh, chapter 6 to verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Watch what Jesus says there. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So there's an aspect to discipleship that looks at the Lord Jesus and realizes the way that we're going to become like him is when we listen to his instruction to us and we begin to follow it in our lives. Doesn't that match what Jesus said? Teach them to what? Obey all that I've commanded you. So there's this aspect to the authoritative teachings of Jesus that is gonna conform us to the image of Christ. But I said also, Galatians chapter four, verse 19. Galatians chapter four, verse 19. And in Galatians chapter four, verse 19, it says this. This is the apostle Paul's heart for the Galatian church. Galatians four nineteen says this. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So that's Paul taking a pretty descriptive metaphor and saying, my passion and pain and labor is to make sure that you have Jesus Christ formed in you. So everything that we do inwardly as a church is so that you will grow into the image of Jesus Christ because people who grow into the image of Jesus Christ will advance the gospel of Jesus Christ because they realize that's the most important mission that our Savior has given to us. So now we're talking back in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. We wanna just use this as a jumping off point and then we're gonna get to a text. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and here's what we just wanna notice from the text inwardly. You need to baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we see that baptism is an integral part of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, but you have to make sure that you understand baptism correctly. I don't know where the background of everybody here in the congregation and and where you've come from, but we believe in in, in a credo baptism here at Compass Bible Church Tustin. We believe that you get baptized based off your confession of Jesus Christ, that you confess that you've repented of your sins, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and he has saved you. 
Baptism is not a work that earns you salvation. It is evidence of it. It's, a, it's an obedience step that you take to publicly profess the Lord Jesus Christ and that you are now following him because of his work in your life. See, there are other different traditions. One, uh, pedo baptism Maybe you've heard of that before, pedo, infant baptism. And to think of infant baptism doesn't fit, I think, the text of the New Testament, and I think it misunderstands the Old and New Covenants. But here, specifically in the text, I think it eliminates any idea of you being able to say that pedo baptism is what the Bible's talking about. Because the people that you baptize are the people that you instruct to obey everything that Christ has commanded. I don't know how many of you have had infants. We've had five in our house, okay? After I change the infant's diaper, I don't open the scriptures and start to exegete something for that little baby because they're not gonna understand. They have no ability to reason and think through things and to respond properly to, to follow the commands of their Lord and Savior. So here we see the, the baptism is associated with ones who are able to be taught and to follow after those commands. That's why I don't think you can have Pedo baptism. So just pause here for a moment. This is a question to you. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, have you been baptized? If you haven't been baptized, you're missing a step of obedience in the discipleship process. And it's a great one that does a lot to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ because we put you in a, a bucket, I'll say. It's not a bucket, but we put you in a pool and you stand in the freezing cold water and what you get to do is proclaim I was a sinner in need of a savior. I could not earn it myself. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, rose again three days later. I believe that now and Christ has changed my life. You get to advance the gospel that way. There shouldn't be fear behind you of getting in a, a tub to be able to, to proclaim that. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great picture to show what has happened in salvation. So if you haven't been baptized, please contact us. We'll, we'll get some Dora the Explorer in, inflatable thing out here and we'll do a baptism service right here in the sun okay it'll be smoking hot but you'll still have an opportunity to see the gospel advance if you've done that but you should also think about this have you got baptized in the right order there's some people because they grow up in church maybe they have a religious experience maybe they go to a camp maybe some camps have even done like a baptism there they get baptized and then what happens is they live a life that doesn't match that of the gospel which proves that they were never really saved then they get saved later on and they go, okay, well, I got baptized even though I wasn't saved then. I, I was baptized so I fulfilled the command. Well, that's not again what I think the text is talking about. It's after you've responded to the gospel, after, subsequent, that you get baptized because it's a picture of you being dead and being raised into the newness of life to follow Jesus Christ. So if either one of those describes you, please come talk to us because we want you to be baptized to give proclamation of the Lord's work in your life and to advance the gospel. But notice specifically this, this is kind of cool. You get baptized what? In the name, beautiful phrase right there. In the name singular of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is a great text for you if you ever need to describe the Trinity to somebody. This is a Trinitarian doctrine, probably the earliest and clearest, that says there is one name that you get baptized, but three people that represent that name. What a cool thing to, to say, I'm gonna get baptized into this name. I'm gonna confess this name as my Lord and my God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This text and 2 Corinthians uh, 3.14 are great Trinitarian texts that show Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. But what we wanna focus on today is this. Once you've been baptized into that name, you teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Guys, you have to understand how great that text is teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Notice what that says. All of God's commands are always in vogue. There's never an expiration date on God's expectations for you and I. That's very helpful when you talk to people who wanna say, ah, there's some parts of the scripture that are really like culturally kind of associated and so we don't really need to follow those today. Jesus has an idea of his discipleship and his discipleship is this, my authoritative word will be authoritatively lasting until, notice the text, the end of the age. So there's no time, there's no expiration date on the commands of what our master wants us to do. And we're to teach to observe. Observe is like to keep, to hold, to obey. Jesus was chided by the religious leaders for not keeping or observing the Sabbath. You're not doing what you should be doing on the Sabbath. Obviously they were wrong. But it's that idea of being focused on a command and following it and carrying it out. 
So here's what I wanna do this morning. We're gonna do it this week and next week. This week we're talking about the inward development of Christ-likeness in one another. I wanna go to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter one. So turn with me to 1 Thess chapter one. And this week and next, as we talk about the inward and the outward, we'll talk about the first the command and the Great Commission, and then we'll watch it played out in a church so you and I know how to make sure we're accomplishing what God wants us to do. First S, chapter one. We're gonna take a look at verses two to seven this morning. First S, two to one, and I'll keep repeating that as long as there's an airplane over my head. First S, two, one. It says this, we give thanks to God always for you, all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. I think the Thessalonian church, probably Paul's earliest letter, is a great example of a church that takes the great commission in both aspects, inward and outward, and does a very good job of them. So we wanna take a look, first of all, in verses two to four at something that Paul sets up well for the Thessalonian church. He talks about the environment, the culture of the church, and sets a great example for them as he begins to talk about how we should view progress in Christ-likeness as we pursue it. Look at 1 Thess 2, 1, 2 through 3. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what I want you to write, number one on, on your outline, then we'll go to the text. If we're gonna be a church that does this, we need to be a church, uh, you need to be on the lookout for God's work. Be on the lookout for God's work. If we're gonna make any sort of headway in the inward development of disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be on the lookout for God's work. Guys, what an environment that, that would be to live in. Do you notice that the Apostle Paul is doing that in almost every single one of his letters? The only one is Galatians, and that's because they're dropping the ball in the gospel. Of course, he's not gonna praise them if they're messing up how you get saved. But even a church like the, the Corinthian church, Paul starts with thanksgiving, and he's got a lot of rebuke for them. But he starts with thanksgiving because he always wants to be on the lookout for God's work. So notice how he said it. We give thanks to God for all of you. So the Thessalonians are an indirect part of this uh, praise report from Paul. So he's trying to encourage them, but he's doing so indirectly. Listen, I'm seeing good things going on inside of you, but I want to give thanks to God because I realize he's the reason all of it's happening. And when we're a church that is on the lookout for that, I think that's going to create a great environment to watch discipleship happen. Have you been in the opposite environment? An environment where people are hyper and critical, which is not to say that we can't rebuke, which we must. We must point out sin when we need to. Again, Paul's great example with the Corinthians. Praise them, but point out things that are wrong that are not honoring to Jesus Christ when you do it. But have you ever been in the stifling environment of just hyper criticism? What if we, as a church, were on the lookout constantly for God at work in the lives of one another and we pointed that out to one another and gave thanks to God for that? What type of environment would that church be? It would be exactly what I think Paul's doing here. Notice the word always and all. Always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope. So this is what we have, this great environment of the Apostle Paul right here. So let's be on the lookout for God at work. I think Paul gets very specific here. He says, remembering your uh, work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope. So when Paul is bringing those virtues out, you see faith, hope, and love, that's a, a theme that he constantly does. We won't have time to turn there. I'll just give you these other passages. It's um, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love are talked about there. 1 Corinthians 13. And then uh, first, uh, Col Colossians 1, 3 through 8, 
Paul talks about how the gospel has progressed because of the faith, hope, and love of the Colossian church. One theologian I read this week says, when you bring up faith, hope, and love as virtues in a Christian, you're giving the the simplest and the truest definition of what a Christian is. Just the the briefest description of somebody you can. They have faith that God is the one who saves. They love God and one another, and they have a great hope that whatever's gonna happen, God is gonna save and rescue them. So faith, hope, and love. But what I love is the way that the Apostle Paul put it here in these texts, because in talking about these things, he's putting the virtues really as the source of what's producing the effort that's being described. So he would say, uh, your work of faith is faith that develops into work or produces work. Kind of like the way James talks about faith, right? Faith without works is dead. Or when he says your, your labor of love, it's love that produces hard work, toil for other people. Or when he talks about the steadfastness of hope, it's hope that's gonna produce a, a steadfastness, an endurance. And that again is pointing to the, the work that God has done. He's invested faith, love, and hope in the believers. So we're not taking any credit for it. We're noticing, oh yeah, if this is developing, then it's gotta be God who's doing it. That's why we wanna be a church that's constantly on the lookout for that. When is the last time you honestly did that to somebody else in the church? You went up to them and you specifically wanted to give praise to God because of something you saw in their life. Paul does that constantly because he realizes there is no human effort that is gonna make this happen without God's involvement. And if that's what you genuinely believe, that God is the one who's gonna do this, then I'm gonna make every effort, I'm gonna toil, I'm gonna strive to make sure I don't miss any moment for me to give praise to God. And that's why I love the focus of Christ likeness. Do you get that? Okay, you know your heart better than anybody. I know my heart. I know my weaknesses. I know where I'm tempted. And if I sit back for a moment and think, the goal of discipleship is to look like Jesus in and of myself, that's impossible. How am I gonna change and transform so that I look like the son of God who poured himself out for people who did not love him, but he loved them so much that he gave his life. How can any sinner do that on their own? You can't. That's why 2 Corinthians 3.18 is gonna tell us, from one degree of glory to another, the spirit is at work in us, transforming us into the image of Christ. So any growth, any progress you see in Christ-likeness is because God is at work and we wanna be the people who are giving credit to that. You know, I can't wait till I'm in like, my mid-70s, I think that's gonna be a good time for me. That's when I'm really gonna hit my stride. I don't fit right now. I complain like a 70-year-old man, okay? I have a lot of complaints. I really just, I wanna own a porch and I wanna have a rocker on it and I wanna sit on that porch and I wanna say things like, this is mine now. I cannot wait to do that. Have you ever had that? Like when I was a kid, I'd throw it and it'd go on the porch of somebody and because we did it so much, they'd say, this is mine now. I wanna do that. I wanna be able to do that, okay? And you know what else I wanna do? I wanna have a metal detector. I wanna do it. I wanna go to the beach and I wanna have a metal detector. This past summer, I told you I was kidnapped and taken to the beach by some people in the church so that we had to be there. And as we were there, I watched this guy and he had a metal detector and a floppy hat, which I think is only appropriate for older men to wear floppy hats like that. I had this floppy hat going around socks, shorts, everything on the beach and just combing over the beach, combing over the beach. You know what he did? Same spot over and over again. Why? Because he's desperate to find treasure or whatever he's looking for. I looked at that old man and I thought, okay, there is something to that. Why did he go back and forth over the same spots over and over again? Until he found something, he wasn't gonna leave. That might be a good way for you to think about the encouragement you need to bring to others and the praise to God. It takes some effort. You're really gonna have to sit down and comb through the life of people in your small group the life of your spouse. I mean, imagine how that would transform your marriage, right? If instead of constantly fighting, you looked at your spouse and you showed them different ways that you saw them grow to be like Jesus Christ. And you spend time scouring their life, watching, okay, yeah, I saw you react like that one time. I didn't think that was great, but man, you changed. That's gotta be the Spirit's work in your life. What if you approached ministry that way? What if that's the way we lived in community with one another? That I was so desperate to see evidences of true Christ likeness in you. Now, what I love about the Apostle Paul is he's not one to give empty words, is he? He doesn't like flattery. We're not talking about making things up in the lives of other people. 
Flattery is empty. We're talking about spirit-produced evidence of Christ's likeness in the lives of people. Paul can do that. Faith, hope, and love, I see it in you. God's doing that in you. I wanna give him the credit. Take a look at verse four. Make sure we, we, we know it's evidence of God's work because when we see evidence of God's work in the present, we'll remember God's work in the past. Take a look at verse four. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. So when we're seeing the evidence of God at work in someone's life, it reminds us to go back and think of the greatest evidence of God working in someone's life, the salvation of somebody's soul. We know brothers loved by God that he has chosen you. What a great thing to think about the salvific work of God as being monergistic, moner, one, mono, one, gistic, one person working. The salvation of God is monergistic. He's the one who's, who's done it. This word right here, uh, loved by God, is a great word. Perfect passive participle. And I don't say that because I want to impress you with my Greek. I want you to think about what it means. Perfect happens in the past and it has effects that go to the present and into the future. Passive, it was done by someone else. It wasn't done by me. So God loved you in the past, not because you did something great, but because he chose to set his love on you. When you see evidence of Christ-likeness in someone's life currently, it should cause you to go back and go, yeah, that only happened because God loved them in the past and saved them. And that salvation was accomplished by God. Notice this, because the gospel came not just in word, right? It wasn't just given to them as, hey, here's some facts. That's gonna change your life. It's gotta come with the, the word and it's gotta come with the Holy Spirit and with power. Here's a great way for you to think of that phrase. What would it look like for the gospel to come in word only? Remember when we went through the gospel of Mark? Mark chapter four is the parable of the sowers. And there are three soils that receive the word, but it's not genuine salvation, right? There's the rocky soil. There's a soil where it springs up, but it gets choked out. There's a soil that it can't take root. That's the gospel in word only. The gospel goes there and it hits, but it doesn't take effect. But the last one that produces fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold, is the gospel coming not just in word, but with power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, meaning God's gotta be there in regeneration to make it happen. This is what we're talking about. The current work will cause us to remember the great work of salvation that God has done for us. So the love that God has given and the choice that he's given, uh, the choice of us is based on his love for us. So this is what we have inside of that. Here's another text for you just to write down 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. And here's uh, what Paul's saying there. He's saying, yeah, I didn't come just trying to impress you with my logic and how I could turn phrases, but I came to you in weakness so that you would know that my message is about the, the message and the power and the Holy Spirit that comes together. So your faith is not in man, but your faith is ultimately in God who's the one who's going to accomplish that. Here's what we want to do. We want to be people who are scouring for evidence of God at work in the lives of people. But notice where Paul takes a turn right there in the middle of verse five. So he's talking about the gospel that's come. They've preached the gospel to them. That's the outward component. We'll talk about that next week. And notice this. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So Paul, although he does say the gospel has to come with the power of the Holy Spirit for there to be any effect there, he does show that there is some importance of evidence of change in the life of the person who's preaching the gospel to people. And that's why it's important that we develop one another to be Christ-like disciples because if we go out and proclaim a gospel that doesn't change us into the likeness of Christ, why should somebody listen to us when we say it's the power of God unto salvation that's gonna transform your life? Our ability to go out with a lifestyle that matches that of Jesus Christ is very important to our gospel witness. We'll get into that next week, but let's just talk about the importance of developing Christ-likeness in us. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. See that phrase, prove to be? It's an interesting translation that you have here because it's the word ginomai in the Greek. And over the next three verses, Paul's gonna use that as almost this chain of events that needs to happen in discipleship. There is this you proved to be this type of person when you shared the gospel. You proved to be the type of person who has Christ forming in them. You proved to be this person who's moving towards greater, greater conformity to that of, 
of Christ, your lifestyle matched the gospel that you preached. That's what you think about when you think about Christ likeness, right? Self-sacrifice based on love for other people. And so if I'm gonna go preach a gospel of a savior who would die for your sins when you didn't love him, but my life doesn't match that, I'm selfish, I'm prideful, I, I'm not humble, then why are they gonna believe that that's a real gospel that changes anybody? So Paul here's going, listen, the gospel came with power, that's why it saved you, it wasn't me, but guess what? The gospel was at work inside of me. And because I'm becoming more like Jesus Christ, I'm gonna be a disciple who advances the gospel of Christ because that's what I'm gonna care about. So put it down number two on your outline this way. Not only should we be on the lookout for God's work because it's gonna create a great environment for us to grow, but number two, you should be on the lookout for Christ likeness. You should be on the lookout for Christ likeness. Be on the lookout for Christ likeness. Why? Well, Paul says it clearly here in the text. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So Paul now is giving one of the ways that you and I can teach all that Christ has commanded us. When you think of the word teach, think this way, instruction and imitation. That's the full realm of teaching, instruction and imitation. It's very easy, guys. If you ever go to a church, maybe you've been a part of one, it's very easy to be a church that just instructs. I'm gonna tell you this. I'm gonna tell you what this text says. I can tell you the deep details of it. I wanna tell you what this says. Instruction is the easy part. You know what's the very difficult part? Telling someone, watch me as I live it out. And that's where discipleship gets transformed. When you can look at another person and you can say, I believe what the Bible says and by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in me, I want you to watch my life so you know how to live like Jesus Christ. That's when real discipleship happens. If all I have is instruction, I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna tell you this. That's not the full teaching. Instruction that leads to imitation. If you're a parent, you have to understand this, okay? How many times could you say to a kid, go put the dishes away, right? You could say that till you're blue in the face. You could instruct them, go put the dishes away. But you say that to a kid and they have no idea. That's why dishes end up in the toilet in the bathroom because they don't know where to put the dishes. Maybe that just happens in our home, I don't know. You have to in, you instruct them and then what do you do with the kid? This is how you put the dish away. You be careful this way, you need to put it right here. And you're gonna do it over and over again to create that habit in them. The church is no different. Why do you think God sets up the home to match the church? Why do you think he talks familial relationships in the church? Later on in Thessalonians, he's gonna say, I'm like a father and a mother to you because it's how you learn in the home, which is how you're gonna learn in the church. So we need to be on the lookout for Christ likeness in the congregation because we need to imitate it amongst one another. That's what I love about this. I, I told you that word ginemai. So prove to be among you, verse five, is ginemai. Then in verse six, and you became, ginemai, imitators of us and of the Lord. Wow, what a great phrase. Now, some people might wanna sit back and go, wait a second, I can't tell anyone to follow after me. That's, that's prideful, right? I can't do that. I think there's two things that might help you realize that that's not a prideful statement. It's not a prideful statement, number one, if that's the system that God set up. Okay? All I'm doing when I'm asking someone to follow me is following the system that the master's put in there. So if Jesus said, this is the way that we're gonna pass things on, imitate me as I imitate Christ, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna instruct you, and then you're gonna be able to imitate me. It's not prideful if we're doing what Jesus told us to do. And number two, don't you think it's actually more prideful to think, I don't need to imitate anybody, and I don't need an example of this. To me, that's the more arrogant assertion. I can figure this out on my own. Just tell me and I'm gonna go figure it out. That's not how you do it. That's the arrogant statement. If I come and say, no, wait a second, this is, this is hard, this is gonna be difficult. I need to see evidence of this in the life of somebody so that I might follow after them. That's why we want to be practicing Christ likeness amongst one another. Notice how he said it. You became imitators of us, us, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and of the Lord. This is where we're ultimately directing it. Why we're ultimately, it's not arrogant, it's because I'm not trying to create a disciple of Pastor Elliot. You're not trying to create a disciple of you. You're trying to create a disciple of Jesus. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter four. Okay, Paul says this in so many different places. Imitate me, imitate me. He says it in uh, chapter 2, 14 of Thessalonians. He says it in chapter uh, 
uh, three of Second Thessalonians, imitate me, imitate me, imitate me. But listen to how he puts it so, so squarely in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. I love these verses right here. Notice what he said. For though you have, 1 Corinthians 4, 15, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Look at verse 16. I urge you then, okay, be imitators of me. Now watch this phrase. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So do you see how Paul teaches? He instructs, but then he lives a life that should be imitated so you can follow it. So discipleship is not done when I give them doctrine and I don't show them how difficult it is to live out. I need to show them those things. I can't just say, be like Christ. I've got to say, watch me as I pursue Christ-likeness. So Paul can even say, you need to imitate me. And guess what? I can send you Timothy and he's going to teach you how to imitate me because I taught Timothy how to imitate me. It's so interesting that Paul teaches this in every church that he goes to. Now turn to chapter 11, verse 1. You should know this. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. What does Paul say there? After saying, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jew or Greek or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, seeking not my own advantage, but that of the many, that they may be saved. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This is what Paul thought discipleship was. I will instruct you on what the Bible says then by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in me who's conforming me to look like Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to come, follow me as I follow Christ. If you are a disciple and a disciple when he's fully trained will be like Jesus, that's how discipleship happens. So guys, that means you and I when we're in a partners meeting or you and I when we're in a small group meeting or you and I when we're just friends hanging out at the park, we should be trying to think, if I'm going to advance the gospel, I have to be a disciple becoming like Jesus, so how can I help one another as we're on this process. Go back to 1 Thess, chapter one. 1 Thessalonians, chapter one. <clears throat> Let's finish out what Paul says there. Notice how this whole thing ends up. You became imitators of me and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Again, guys, when we get to John uh, chapter 15 and 16, which we're gonna study after we do the Great Commission, I think if we anticipated more suffering that would come in the Christian life, we'd handle it a whole lot better. It is the assumption of Paul that you're gonna suffer sometime for the gospel. It is. If you really take seriously the call to go evangelize, to live like Christ in the midst of a dark generation, it is going to cause some sort of suffering. In all of Paul's letter, except for Philemon, this word tribulation, suffering shows up. And if it shows up so many times, it's the assumption of Paul that you're going to suffer. Because when you stand up for Christ and you watch the gospel go out, those are the things that are going to happen. But when you receive the word, notice it, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, you're going to endure those times. And when you do that in a group of people, you're never going to do that alone. And we want to see the gospel advance. You receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. We know the Holy Spirit is the only producer of joy, Galatians 5.22. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And that happens in the midst of our suffering. Then watch this. So that you became, there's Genemai again. Here's the third process. You saw it in us. You became imitators of us. And now you become imitators to other people, an example, a type, a pattern to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. This is how discipleship is happening. I see this is what Jesus did. He died on the cross for sins. He, he was self-giving, self-sacrificial. He was humble. I'm gonna live that out in my life so that you can see how to live that out in your life. And that's gonna pass on from believer to believer. This is what you have to do if you want to see the gospel advance. Again, a gospel is, we're only gonna be disciples who advance the gospel when we're disciples who are becoming like Jesus. Maybe we can begin to think about it this way. You're, you're there right now and you're waiting for the plane to pass like me. And we're trying to think these things through. So I'm gonna be in to just kind of talk until the plane goes by. I wish it would go much faster. This is like a super slow plane, um, but it's still there and it's almost by and now we can continue the sermon. See, that's how you just smoothly transition with those types of things. 
We're talking about serious things now. That was foolishness. So think about this. We're trying to develop Christ-likeness in one another. Here's how you have to think, am I a part of that at Compass Bible Church Tustin? I want you to think of a water heater, okay, to challenge you. Think about a water heater. I was having lunch with a friend, uh, probably really at the beginning of the pandemic. We, we ate outside, we were socially distanced, and we were talking, and he was telling me about a hot water heater that busted in his house. It got me thinking about a hot water heater that we had trouble with last summer. We right now are renters in our home. There's some bad things about being a renter, but you know what, there's some great things about being a renter. When big things happen, as a renter, all I have to do is call and let, let go of everything else. I don't have to do anything else. Hey, you're the owner of the house. I need this fix. You go, you go deal with it. It's not my problem because I'm renting. That was a lot different with the conversation I had with my friend because he owns his house. When he began to tell me about his water heater troubles, he told me, I'm crawling under the house. I'm getting dirty. I'm checking for slab leaks. I'm doing all of these things. Why is he doing that? Because he owns his house. He doesn't get to pass it off to anybody else. He's the steward of it, to quote Matthew's sermon from a couple weeks ago. He has the, the responsibility to take care of that. So what I'm asking you to do right now is if you come to Compass Bible Church Tustin, I'm asking you to think, do I approach my ministry here as a renter or do I approach it as an owner? Because a renter does this. When the problem comes, I let go. It's not mine to deal with. Somebody else is gonna deal with that. But an owner, they take hold of it. They're active, hands-on. They've got to figure it out because it's their responsibility. If you wanna see the gospel advance, you have to be able to look at people and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Or you have to be able to find other people to say, I need you to show me how to live like Christ because I don't know how to do it here. And the more you take ownership of that, the greater work God is gonna do. But ask yourself the question, am I a renter or an owner here? We want you to be owners. We want you to take ownership because we believe that's what Christ-likeness is. The father sent him on a mission and he didn't sit back and go, whoa, these people are so sinful. I don't need to deal with that. He owned the mission, completed the mission and allowed his salvation to heaven. And then what did he say to his disciples? Just as I've been sent, so send I you into the world. So we're on a mission right now and I want you to take ownership of that. Don't rent when you come here. Be an owner and watch what God will do. We wanna see Christ formed in one another. We wanna point that out and give praise to God. And when you go to a church like that, I think you'll see them make a difference for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will be a group of disciples who are advancing the gospel. Let's pray that God will give us the grace to be able to accomplish that here at Compass Bible Church Tustin. Father, you are so good to us. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for giving us the Savior who saved us from our sins. God, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We didn't want Christ. He died for us. We were loved by God when we were unlovable. God, it's incredible to think that Jesus would sacrifice for us that way. But God, the amazing truth of the gospel is not only does it save us from something, it saves us to something. And it saves us to be conformed to the image of God's son. That's what Paul says in Romans 8, 29. Those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God, that is a privilege and we don't wanna take that lightly. So may everything that we encounter, God, push us to the mission that the church should be doing. And that is to, to follow through with making disciples of Jesus Christ, making them more like the Savior who saved them. God, we need your spirit. We need one another. We need you to do a great work. So we ask that you do that. We give you credit for all that, that you've done so far. And we pray right now that as we sing and teach one another through song, that we've reminded of the truth that it's not to us, but to you that we should give glory. So help us, Father, we pray to have the right mindset in Jesus' name. Amen.